time falls after we're done. Let me go over the, the materials I've got. I sent y'all a note yesterday, but I just want to re-emphasize again before I get really cranked up. I posted three handouts and I posted some slides just a minute ago. The slides and the handout are dead even, maybe one thing different between them. They're very much the same. I'm going to present and key off the slides. I think it'll just be easier. But if you like to take notes um, on a handout and you just pull up your Word document, you can do that. You're not going to be messed up. Um, and if there's any discordance between the two, just, just call it out to me. But I think pretty much they're the same. So, so you, you're going to have the slide of the therapy of, of erectile dysfunction and BPH. I had a handout that I put in there, Pathophysiology of uh, Erectile Dysfunction and BPH. If you want to look at it, it's just a reference source. I know that this was covered, or at least I was told it would be covered yesterday, and it should have been. Was it, was it covered? And they, they go over the anatomy and the pathophys in a way that is, sets up very well for what we're going to do here. If they had not done it and don't do it, I'm certainly uh, willing to do that here, but I think it was covered. Uh, do y'all feel pretty comfortable with that mm -hmm. presentation? Okay, so the presentation we're doing on erectile dysfunction will probably add to, and we'll get into a lot more details and nuances just to kind of give you some uh, further appreciation for it. Um, so you've got that handout. I am not testing off of that. It's posted for reference only. It's not intended to, don't let it create anxiety over the weekend study for the test because I am not even looking at that to pull questions off of it. If there's anything on that handout that I'm going to make questions about, it will also be on the handouts I'm actually covering. So how pathophys interacts with drug therapy, I may make comments about that. That can be testable material, but I'm not going there and looking for stuff. It will come out of the handouts that we're working off of. Um, so we have erectile dysfunction, BPH, and we also have a handout I'll put up for you on acute and chronic prostatitis. It will be very quick. It's only a page and a three quarters of a handout, and we'll look at that at the very end. And I just want to highlight a few points that are important for clinical management uh, from a drug therapy standpoint, and then we'll be done with what we're going to cover. Um, so that's just what we have uh, available. Are y'all doing okay? Is this week going okay for y'all? Okay. Did anybody get flooded yesterday? I mean, it was ridiculous. I I had no idea that it was supposed to be that way. I mean, I got up in the morning and just kind of going along mirror, and all of a sudden it got darker and darker and darker. And I got here, but just as it started to rain, I didn't realize I could have been flooded out somewhere, except the second floor flooded. The, the, the little portico area where you come in and started come down the hallway, and I thought, you know, I don't expect to travel to the second floor when the water starts coming out. Fortunately, it stopped at the threshold before it got to the PA conference room, and I thought, this is all I need is a wet carpet uh, with mold. Drive me crazy. And that loud fan. And that thing, I mean, right now I have white noise I didn't ask for. I can't hear anything. It's just <laughs> boring out there. I'm going to kind of let that go. But it was an interesting day yesterday. Um, so let me see if this thing actually works. Is this working from a distance now? Yes. We've had, oh yes, oh how lovely, go ahead. So I can hang out here a little bit. Um, let's just kind of move into it. Um, the, the handouts, if you look at the handout that I posted, the paper copy, I've given you American um, Urological Association guidelines for both erectile dysfunction and BPH. I, I gave you the web links. They've been updated recently. They were both updated for 2018. Uh, that was a change from last year. I only give you those links on the handout so that when you go to clinical phase, rotations, you're doing stuff, you have another source you can look at. So the handout is set up as a resource for later. I don't expect you to link in there and read all that stuff. Uh, even though it's actually very well organized, very bullet pointed, it's, it's a good place to go find stuff. And if you want depth, and you need even more depth, that's the place to go find it. But just know what that is. Information, reference only. I'm not going there. You don't have to read that this weekend. I've, I've abstracted what I want. Okay. So first, let's look at erectile dysfunction. Very briefly, just going to talk about patient evaluation. I know you've had that, but let's just kind of look at it again. Uh, it's not an overly complex evaluation, but it does need to be done. Often, it's not done. 
of people just make assumptions and folks say, here's what my problem is, and people just go ahead and prescribe something, and they might be missing important big things. But four uh, components of the evaluation on this slide listed medical history, so you want to pass concurrent medical problems because there can be a number of secondary issues that can lead to erectile dysfunction, as you know. Um, common, diabetes, atherosclerotic processes, all of those things can lead to uh, problems with um, blood supply to the penis. Uh, sexual history is very important, detailed history of the, the dysfunction that's experienced. Folks will often not tell you what's going on. Is it an inability to have an erection? Is it an inability to sustain an erection? Is it an inability to even have interest? Uh, is it, uh, you know, what is it? Is it just episodic, things work well, then they don't work well? What is it? And it's important to get those details before you do therapy because you, otherwise it's very difficult for you to evaluate whether it's been effective or not, or even to know what the problem might be. So that's an important uh, piece of the story. Psychosocial history is also very important. I think you can understand why. People who are stressed, people who are depressed, people who have anxiety, all of those things can affect uh, sexual functioning uh, from the standpoint of lack of interest and inability might actually be psychogenic. It might originate in um, uh, the cognitive sphere, just how a person's feeling, what they're thinking about. Uh, can have an impact. So that psychosocial history is always real important. Uh, and then finally, the physical exam is important uh, to assess for hormonal, vascular, or neurologic problems. Did y'all feel like in your presentation earlier this week that you had good outline of uh, hormonal issue, vascular, and or neurologic issues that might lead to erectile dysfunction? Was it legitimate enough? Did you feel comfortable? Okay. Just if, if at any point I say something with an assumption that you have gotten it down, just raise your hand, stop me, and we'll, we'll uh, address it. S selective lab, I'm going to give you quite a few different lab tests. All of these don't necessarily need to be run, and so it's listed as selective lab because based on what the person says, the history, these are some things that you can look at. Your analysis, obviously, to evaluate for potential infection or some organic problem that might lead to erectile dysfunction. Blood count, uh, again, complete blood, blood count to evaluate for potential infection. Uh, fasting glucose to evaluate for diabetes because it's a very uh, common problem in diabetic individuals. And creatinine to evaluate for renal dysfunction. Um, I don't know if it was said specifically, but people have chronic renal failure tend to have bigger problems with erectile dysfunction. As you know, with chronic renal failure, a wide range of metabolic derangements take place and many organ functions are affected negatively. And this is just one thing that can show up. Other lab that can be looked at, fasting lipid profile to evaluate for atherogenic causes. They're very common in Oklahoma. Oh gosh, this is one of the big states for obesity and all kinds of cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes. All of those can lead to atherosclerotic processes. If you have atherosclerosis in the arterial supply to the corpora cavernosa, then you may have an inability to have an effective uh, erection or reliable, a lot reliable one. So that's a, a good screen. And another one that you want to look at too is serum testosterone for hormonal causes. I think it's interesting, but a couple of years ago the definition for testosterone dis deficiency was actually less than 400 nanograms per mil. And I looked at the new guidelines uh, that came out for 2018 and they listed testosterone deficiency as less than 300 nanograms per mil. So they let it float down. And I'm kind of wondering I, I couldn't read it to make it come to, to be able to make this a definitive statement. I'm wondering if they haven't defined it more narrowly because you have all these low T and testosterone clinics popping up and they're trying to really classify what's low because there tends to be an indiscriminate use of testosterone for a wide number of issues. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But uh, I found it interesting that they floated the definition down a little bit lower. So you have to be below that to actually be considered uh, testosterone deficient or in a hypogonadal state. From a lab perspective, the way it would be drawn, 
you always draw a morning serum total testosterone level. You all know by now that all kinds of blood levels and hormonal levels have variation, diurnal variation throughout the day. And if you measure morning one time and then you check afternoon the next time and try to compare those, they don't have real meaning. But if you clock it at the same time, then they have more meaning, you know, for that individual person. So a minimum of two are usually required to make the diagnosis of testosterone deficiency if you're going to go that route. And that's important because if you're going to put somebody on testosterone, there are quite a few complications and things to look for that you, that you need to know. So you want to be sure that actually are testosterone deficient before you get into it. Another thing that is kind of new with the guidelines this year that they have not mentioned before, they've kind of been on the periphery, is how important it is to use a validated questionnaire to evaluate for the severity of erectile dysfunction. Erectile dysfunction is one of those things where, where a, a male patient might over-exaggerate or want some powers that are beyond, you know, reasonable or physiologic. And so if you don't really classify exactly what's going on, it's very difficult to, to measure progress over time. So there are now several validated questionnaires that you might see in a urologist office. You might actually have them in a primary care practice, uh, depending on how you are, what system you're in, how they're set up. But you can assess severity of erectile dysfunction. You can use them to measure effectiveness. So you have a score at the baseline. You have a score after treatment. And then you can also look to see if you're reaching targets that you'd like to reach or scores you'd like to reach. I've just meant to list these out here. I do not expect you to memorize these. I'm not going to ask a question about them. I just want you to know that validated questionnaires are a very important part of assessing and monitoring, you know, response to treatment. So there's a bunch. Erection hardness score, sexual health inventory for men, the SHIM, International Index of Erectile Function and Male Sexual Health Questionnaire, which is larger than just for erection. It has to do with all kinds of psychosocial aspects uh, of sexual functioning. Okay, this is a slide that is not in the handout in the order that I've been going. Um, it's on the pathophysiology section, but I wanted to put it on here because it is a huge important issue that has to be looked at when you're assessing a patient for erectile dysfunction, and that is medications and other agents. You all know as you kind of get deeper into this thing that you always try to rule out things that can be causing problems and medications always end up in that list of rule outs because they, they do a lot of good things but they can also cause problems and you don't want to just keep giving somebody a medicine that's causing a problem and fail to think about it um, when you're doing your assessment. So here's a list of some of the types of agents that can cause a problem. Antihypertensives, almost all of them, if you go pulling them up, literally, almost all of them. But the ones that are more likely are beta blockers and anything that works in the CNS centrally, like clonidine, uh, can be problematic. Again, just, just hear me talk about this. I'm not actually going to get onto the, the weeds about this one. But when you look at medications that are implicated, you really have to focus on timeline. If a person's been on a beta blocker for 10 years and now they say they have erectile dysfunction, what's the likelihood that the beta blocker is the recalcitrant agent? Not so much. What if you put them on a beta blocker a month ago and now they come back and they're complaining about erectile dysfunction? That's more likely. So the time course and the, the relationship between when something was started and when a problem shows up is an important detail to look at. Now just to make the waters muddy, if they have, let's say they have um, an atherosclerotic process cooking all along, they're on a beta blocker for high blood pressure and CAD, and then they, the atherosclerotic process keeps advancing to the point where the beta blocker is the tipping point, then even though it's been there for a long time, maybe removing it could be helpful. So now I'm telling you two things. <laughs> if they've been on for a long time, it's less likely and that's the true statement. If they've been on a short time and you have ED, then it's more likely. But, but don't fail to continue to consider that the beta blocker might be adding the tipping point you know, to somebody who's near the edge. 
because other disease processes keep rolling forward too. Uh, okay, now that, now that I've told you that, you don't quite know what to do with it, but <laughs> I'll put it out there. It's just something to think about. And then it's like all things with medicines. You have to consider benefit and risk. Let's say you had ED, but, they're, but they have to be on a bad blocker for other reasons. You might have to leave that alone and work with therapy for ED on top of it. Okay? Um, another group of drugs, antidepressants, classic, they themselves can cause erectile dysfunction, but the depression that they are treating can also be the cause of erectile dysfunction. Anti-androgenic drugs. Anything that shuts down testosterone activity or action uh, can be part of it. Uh, and I've given you a drug here, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors uh, like finasteride may decrease libido. These drugs are going to show up again in treatment for prostate problems. So just early preview, you can be treating a prostate problem and now creating an ED problem, okay, because of the way those drugs work. Have y'all talked about 5-alpha reductase as an enzyme? It, it, it probably has showed up before now. Have y'all heard that? Y'all heard about it? Y'all know, what does it do? It's can anybody? It converts testosterone to DHT. Right. It, good. Very good. So it, it's the enzyme that converts testosterone into 5-DHT, uh, 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 you know, which is a more active form of testosterone. Testosterone kind of seeps into cells passively, and then when it gets inside a cell, that, that, that enzyme converts it into a more active form. Uh, and that will be important a little bit further down the road, but that's exactly what's going on. And then you use these drugs to shut it down. Um, they can create problems with erection. Um, alcohol abuse is another area, pretty common one. You can get alcoholic neuropathies in the nerves that supply the penis, and that can be enough to make a erectile dysfunction a problem for a person. Uh, and cigarette smoking facilitates development of vascular insufficiency. So people who drink and smoke heavily very often have erectile dysfunction. Um, I'm almost imagining if somebody's had a long alcohol history and they've had a big smoking history and they get up into their 50s and 60s and they say they have erectile dysfunction. It's like, mm-hmm. I mean, it's almost like it's just something that's going to just, it's cooked into the cake. You know, when you do that, uh, you're going to have a consequence. Okay. But I just want you to be familiar with those agents. Those are some common ones that are out there. But again, you'll have to, anything that's starting new and a new problem pops up, look, and you will find erectile dysfunction tied to a wide range of drugs. These are just some of the biggest, most common ones to think about. Okay, okay management um, of erectile dysfunction. Obviously, you have to identify and treat comorbidities and psychosexual function. So if somebody's depressed, treat depression. If somebody has an anxiety issue, treat anxiety. Uh, if somebody has other behavioral problems, then treat those behavioral problems. And so you have to identify those in advance and then go ahead and treat them. If they have comorbidities, let's say they have hyperlipidemia, uncontrolled, high blood pressure, out of control, all these elements that lead to atherosclerosis, then, you know, diet, exercise, weight loss, all of those things are helpful. And if the erectile dysfunction is very early in process, then those things can actually slow down the develop, you know, further development and might actually lead to reversal. Mostly in the clinical arena, people are already too far gone for those lifestyle interventions to reverse anything. But what you do, you still emphasize those because it's a, it's a progressive process. And if their behaviors have led erectile dysfunction at a certain level, and they continue those behaviors, then you continue to drive the disease process further down the road. So you always halt. And patients are always saying, well, will this make it go away? No, but this will keep it from getting worse. Okay, so you always have to put it out there and they may go, yeah, I've already lost, I'm going to do what I want to eat and do what I want to do. And it's like, okay, but now you can't complain. <laughs> you make a choice. Okay. Um, so you always want to identify and manage the comorbidities and that's part of that evaluation that, that you do. And then there are five broad kinds of therapies available. 
PDE5 inhibitors, Viagra and light and similar drugs, intraurethral alprostadil, that's inserting it up the urethra, intracavernous vasoactive drug injection, that's a syringe, small bore needle injected into the corporate cavernosum. Yikes. <laughs> Vacuum constriction devices, which actually create a negative pressure so that things open up. I mean, it, it's an interesting device we'll look at, and I, I, I think y'all talked about it yesterday. And then penile prosthesis implantation. That is just actually physical management put in devices or balloons that can be inflated uh, when erection is needed and then deflated when erection is not needed. So those are some of the things to look at. These are pretty much organized in the order of selection. They are ranked by effectiveness and level of invasion, okay, in, in invasiveness. So oral, an oral medication is obviously very effective, they're effective, and it's not that invasive, you just take it. When you start getting down to intraurethral alprostadil, that's a little more invasive. Uh, intracavernous vasoactive drug injection, that's a little more invasive, and the other things become more uh, invasive as time goes by. So they're ranked in the order that you might want to think about selecting. Okay. So they're, they're selected in a stepwise fashion, balancing out invasiveness, increasing invasiveness versus risk. Informed patient decision making is the standard of care. Uh, you have to ask the patient what they want done. Okay, and it's important, if possible, to actually involve the partner. You know, the sexual partners ought to be in agreement on how they will be managed. Okay, everybody thinks taking a pill is easy. It doesn't, doesn't affect the partner, it just affects the, the, the male um, functioning. So that's, it's a consideration, you want to see what the partners think. I have been kind of taken aback at times uh, when I've been involved with this, what partners want to do. You know, you start thinking about entering your urethral administration of medicines and you think about the injections. I mean, I don't know most men who will say, oh, I think that's my preferred method <laughs> is to be stuck, you know, in the penis repetitively. It's like, no, that's not, not something that's desired. But I have known, when I worked at the VA back in the day, they were using intracavernous injections, and there were some patients who actually thought that was part of their foreplay. And the, the, the woman liked to do the injection. Well, you, yeah, that's how hard. <laughs> but honest to goodness, the treatment was part of how they got ready to have sex. And it's like, I, I'm not thinking about it like that, but okay, this is informed decision making. So people would really decide that. So you never know. You can have an opinion and an attitude, and most people are going to want the oral tablets. But don't throw everything else away. Just de facto, you might be surprised. So it's important for partners to talk about how things will be managed. And the more invasive the therapy is, the more it impacts the partner because there's timing involved. Uh, uh, the timing issue, the methodologies can, can maybe, it either turns people on or it turns people off. So you have to let people be part of it. Okay. This is a lecture where when you start, when you get going, it's like, I don't know. You can say something that's offensive and you're not trying to, so give me a wide range here, folks, because there are. <laughs> I can just tell you stuff I've said in the past, it will break you up. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing good right now, but I guarantee y'all won't make it out of here <laughs> in one uh, intact. Right. <laughs> okay, it's Friday. You gotta have a little bit of fun. <laughs> All right, so beyond informed decision making, if you have high primary hypogonadism, that's the easiest thing of all. Because if you know you're low in testosterone, replacement with androgen therapy is a treatment of choice. Okay, if you're low and that's the reason you're having um, uh, erectile dysfunction, replacement with testosterone, voila. It's harder when you get into vascular and neurogenic uh, sources or causes. Okay, if a patient is taking a drug therapy that has the potential to cause ED, change in drug therapy may be helpful. I already talked about that earlier in regards to the medicines that can be causative, but may is the operative word. Just because you pull off a beta blocker or just because you stop an antidepressant does not mean that the ED will be fixed. It will have to be evaluated again, 
And my experience has been usually, no, it doesn't do much, okay, usually. Because most people who come are already very deep, you know, in the, their, the disease process is so advanced. And then to address vascular risk factors, as we said earlier, lifestyle changes are always helpful. If I ask you a question about what are important things to do, you'd always pick lifestyle changes. Don't ever drop that off. It's always going to be part of the picture. But is that the solo thing that you would do for most of these people? Probably not. Early, early on, maybe, but not usually. So drug therapy plus lifestyle changes, they always go together. It's like high blood pressure. You're always going to do lifestyle changes, but you might also have to have medications. So it's that same kind of thinking. Let's see here. So let's look at some of the um, agents. And I'm going to do androgens first simply because if you're low testosterone, you replace it, you're in good shape. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. So the indication is obviously primary hypogonadism. Uh, and I already kind of alluded to the low T clinics, but I'm just going to say it here formally. Um, use of testosterone for people who are older, for men who are older, because they think it'll make them have more energy, feel better, and all this, you know, and they're not hypogonadal, that is not indicated or advocated. Even though there are a number of people in this metro area and around the planet that have big sexual functioning clinics and testosterone clinics to give people things to make them feel better, the, the associations are against it. If you cannot document low testosterone, then you're giving testosterone in excess of what their body physiologically has, has produced at that point in life. And even though people will swear, oh, I feel so much better, you cannot eliminate the placebo effect of going to a place and getting stuff. And that's pretty much the snake oil art of what's out there when people are selling testosterone and supplements and all this. It's what people think. Uh, in their head. So it's a huge placebo phenomenon. So low T is not, all these low T clinics, if they're not really checking testosterone and they're just letting you tell them the story about I feel tired, run down, I'm just, I'm 50 something, I'm 60 something, I'm 70 something, I want to be jumping around like I used to when I was 20 and 30, and then they start buying all these things, which they continue to buy, it's Okay, what, you know, what's right or wrong about it? If they psychologically feel better, is it worth the money they pay? Uh, the negative side is what's the consequence of using testosterone preparations in folks who don't need them? Well, there are some, and we'll, we'll get to that here in a second. So what do they do? What does it do if you actually have low, you know, what does testosterone actually do? It improves libido, okay, so desire is increased. That's a, a fact. Sexual function is improved and mood is improved. Very much like when women become estrogen deficient, when men become testosterone deficient, there's mood changes. There's probably a male climacteric, all things being equal. You know, women go through the change. Well, as men lose their hormonal status as well, it's lower. They don't act the same way either. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a behavioral change that can happen. What do they do pharmacologically? Have y'all talked about nitric oxide already? Mm -hmm. is, is, no? Yes. Yes, okay, it showed up. So <coughs> they enhance the release of nitric oxide, and nitric oxide is on the endothelium. Inside these arteries where the blood supply is, there's nitric oxide, and testosterone enhances the release of that nitric oxide. It's not the only thing that makes nitric oxide be released, but it makes it easier for it to to fall off the endothelium and go to the sites of action. Um, and this is particularly true inside the corporate cavernosum where you're trying to get the blood supply to, to go to the distensible erectile tissue that's there. So that's what they do. It is the most important neurotransmitter in the erectile process. You don't have, if you're zero on nitric oxide, you're probably going to have a hard time. Um, having an erection. See, I'll do it. I have a hard time, but you know, you're probably not going to have a hard time. You're talking about no hard time. <laughs> okay, there you go. This one. <laughs> parasympathetic stimulation causes release of nitric oxide. So, parasympathetic stimulation is part of the erectile process. Okay, what's part? What is the the stimulation for ejaculation and, and ending of the erection? Sympathetic. So y'all have the distinction. Parasympathetic gets you ready to go. Sympathetic is ejaculation and then D2 message. Okay, so that's it. it just 
want to be sure we're on the same page. Uh, testosterone enhances that release of nitric oxide. When the levels are low, you have less of it released. And here, just, here it is a, a little bit more at a cellular level. And when nitric oxide comes off those endothelial walls, it can diffuse into the penile vasculature, so those corporate, you know, those cavernosal arteries that we're looking at, uh, and activate enzymes which ultimately lead to more cyclic GMP um, inside the cells. And cyclic GMP leads to calcium being moved outside the cells. And you know when calcium goes outside of a cell, the muscular tone is, is lesser and things relax. So the whole net effect of nitric oxide is to lead to events that cause relaxation of those arteries. And it does it by diffusing inside the cells of the, the, the cavernosa arteries, increasing the levels of cyclic GMP, which then push calcium out, and then you end up with relaxation. Okay? And then that allows more blood flow in, and then you have erection. The enzyme that breaks down cyclic GMP is phosphodiesterase. Okay? So phosphodiesterase kind of ends the process. If you can uh, inhibit phosphodiesterase, then that cyclic GMP level just rises and stays higher, and it, it, it allows you to have more uh, uh, arterial relaxation for longer, so there's greater blood flow in. So basically, uh, inhibiting phosphodiesterase actually allows the process of erection to begin and sustain for longer. Okay. All right. And I, you, I, I saw your slides from yesterday, pretty detailed. Did they talk to y'all? Kind of curious about this. On um, these, these those cavernosa arteries. Did they show you a more detailed picture of what they refer to as the helicine arteries? Did y'all hear that? <coughs> Let me just talk you through this. I don't have a picture of this. These, um, these cavernosa arteries right here on both sides, if you look at them anatomically, they're just think about a long tube. Off that long tube, think of it like a, uh, a scrub brush because there are little arteries that project off perpendicular all the length of that whole artery. So, you know, you got a long tube here, but you have these little arteries projecting out all over, and they're, they're called helicine arteries. So the blood comes down the cavernosa artery, and then it drifts out into those helicine arteries, and then it gets into the sinusoids that, that fill up. So the helicine articles, uh, uh, arterioles are very tiny, but there's a long line of them that are all through there. So it's, you know, when you look at the cavernosa artery, it's not real obvious to me how the blood gets inside the soil tissue, but if you now know that there are multiple, multiple branches going off into all that tissue, that's how the blood actually gets out there and fills up those, those uh, that dispensable tissue that leads to the erection. Okay. Just a picture, you know, don't need to worry about so much, but sexual stimulation, this could be visual hallucinations, you have hallucinations, I guess. Visual, uh, uh, auditory, uh, the cavernosa nerve sends stimulus down. Parasympathetic leads to release of, uh, 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 causes nerve stimulation to, to, uh, to those arteries. Nitric oxide is released, which facilitates that arterial dilation. You've got the uh, cyclic GMP. Uh, levels begin to rise, you have calcium being pushed out, and then you got your PDE5 inhibitors that can actually block the breakdown of cyclic GMP so this process just runs longer. Okay, when should you not use an androgen? This is the, the downside of just using testosterone preparation for the sake of using them. Men who have prostate cancer, some prostate cancers actually are facilitated by testosterone, testosterone activity. So, if you're a patient who has prostate cancer, you probably got to be really careful about what you use testosterone. <coughs> if you don't know you have uh, prostate cancer and you're out in the low T clinics getting on your uh, testosterone, maybe you create a problem, you know, facilitate development um, of a problem. Men who have obstruction of the bladder neck caused by prostatic hypertrophy, testosterone leads to greater tissue growth so that that constriction around the urethra coming out of the bladder is tighter and so that can, if you take a lot of testosterone, you can end up with more bladder outlet obstruction because of that tissue buildup. Uh, so that's an issue in people who already have prostate disease. 
And then pre-existing liver disease is a contraindication for androgens. It's uh, particularly a problem for oral testosterone products, not necessarily so much for topical or injectable. How many of y'all follow the NFL? I'm not a big NFL person. I'm a college football person, but I do, I do watch the NFL. You know, several years back, there was all this, back, I said about 20 years ago, everybody started to get really excited about performance-enhancing drugs and steroids, antibiotic steroids are one of them. Uh, and there were, and it's actually been in the league for a long time. It goes back into the 70s, and there began to be people who were dying. They were dying from brain tumors, or they were dying from uh, cancer, and liver cancer, and tumors. Um, and those were the direct results of using a performance-enhancing agent, and in, in, their, in this case, antibiotic steroids, and it created problems in their body. So that actually led to bigger warnings about this. Um, in fact, a long time ago, anabolic steroids, you know, were not scheduled drugs. They were just kind of out there available. And then because of this identification that using things to bulk up and get muscled up actually caused physical problems long term, tumors in the liver, etc., it began to be listed as a drug that has great abuse potential and, and harm like the opioids. So now they're C3s. I mean, they are controlled substances. Of course, y'all all know there's a big black market out there, too, where people sell stuff out of the trunk of their car. It's all over Oklahoma. You know, it's a sports-oriented state, football players, and you got to bulk up, and, and how you going to do it, you got to get your stuff. Uh, and folks don't want to go through medical care for that because it's not going to necessarily be advocated or supported or even prescribed. So it's a huge thing. It keeps on going on. Uh, but part of it is this liver disease thing that can happen. It's very real. Um, Okay, how do you monitor uh, anabolic steroids or testosterone, you know, for long term? Several things you look at. You always do want to monitor your testosterone levels. Define a, an inadequate baseline, and then where does it go? Do you get it from subtherapeutic to therapeutic? So you do want to do that. And you usually have to assess your levels about one to two months after you start therapy. So you couldn't start it and come back in a week and have a good number. You would have to operate at least in a month. Most people are operating two-month stretches so that they use it consistently and you can see uh, if they're doing okay. Um, hematocrit can increase. Y'all know from your early arena stuff that erythropoietin is the what is it can be stimulated and uh, if you have increased erythropoietin stimulation from um, uh, testosterone, you can end up with that higher hematocrit. Serum lipid values can be elevated. You can get some significant dyslipidemia off of using antibiotic steroids um, and just testosterone products available. Um, liver function tests have to be followed at baseline and periodically to be sure that you're not creating a problem with the liver. And then prostate specific antigen PSA uh, and or digital rectal examination are done to just evaluate prostate when you're using these, these products as well. So you've got several things you're looking for when you are using these drugs. Now what product do you pick? It's usually based on patient preference. Uh, most people like transdermal products for this, this purpose uh, instead of injections, but some people will do injections. Um, oral preparations are generally avoided because of hepatotoxicity. It is true that oral testosterone products are more likely to cause liver problems than the other routes of administration. And as I told you earlier, the testosterone products are all C3, goes back to the anabolic steroid pact. Here are six different types of testosterone products. Oral, buccal mucoadhesive, things that you put inside your mouth that stick to your cheek and gum, it's like skull, <laughs> it's a, a product. Injectables, transdermal uh, patches, implantable subcutaneous pellets uh, can be a problem, and gel testosterone formulations. So there's a lot of different ways to get it in. Um, let's look at them just quickly. An oral preparation example is methyl testosterone, Android, it's a capsule. Uh, they tend to be less effective than intramuscular and transdermal testosterone products. So there's another reason to lean away from them. The higher risk liver and they're a little less effective. So that kind of almost makes them not something that you want to deal with. 
Uh, they're associated with idiosyncratic hepatotoxins, even at low doses, as I said, and it could be cholestasis, hepatitis, benign, or malignant tumors. So it shows up a lot of different ways. Here's the buccal mucoadhesive agent. You see how you do it? It's a little tablet type thing. You just kind of stick it. You pull up your lip and put it on there and just let it sit and it will stick and then it slowly absorbs in. Stryant is one of the products. Uh, just place on the surface of the gum. Injections. There are three injectable types right now. Um, Depotestosterone, which is testosterone sipionate. Testosterone enanthate, which is delatestral, as a, a product name, and then testosterone undecanoate, which is a V. Um, their dosing is all usually one every two to three weeks, except a V is dosed every ten weeks, and that's kind of its advantage, and that's why it costs so much more. <laughs> so the, the older products are every two to three weeks, and then uh, a V is dosed every ten weeks. There are places where, where patients go in every two or three weeks and have somebody give an IM shot. I have had patients who actually gave themselves a shot if they lived out in the boondocks and didn't want to drive in all the way. You just teach them how to do an IM injection and then spouse does the injection. Okay? And, uh, and they, they will go that direction. Um, and then a V uh, is a little bit desirable because of the length of time it will work. Okay, now what's the disadvantage of injectable products? Okay, got those three. Two of them are every two to three weeks. One's every ten weeks. Uh, disadvantages, they tend not to produce an even response between doses. A V might be better. That means if I stick you on week one, your blood levels are higher during week one than they might be in week three before you come back and get your next shot. So they tend to peak and then it kind of goes down. And when the level goes down, the effectiveness goes down. Then you get a shot again and you back up and you go back down. So there's a lot of, there's more variation between the first of the dose interval and the end for those injections. And a V might be a little bit less variation, but even it shows variation between when you first inject and when you come back 10 weeks later for the next go around. Pain with the deep IM injection. Who in here has not had an IM injection? Really? Oh, wait, everything I am just in the muscle, you know, in the butt, rocephin, in the arm, you know, up here, deltoid. Like vaccinations. Yeah. Yeah, vaccinations. Some of the vaccinations are IM and some, a lot of them are subcutaneous. When you have it, you know, you're always, you're, you're going deeper. <laughs> always watch, you know, the nurse kind of thing, they kind of get there where they, where they draw back to come at you like, ooh, I know you're going to do it to me. Okay? But those... Those intramuscular, they do hurt and they are painful for a little bit of time after it's, it's happened. Disadvantages, some more disadvantages. So, uh, variation between levels, pain on injection, and another one, and this is the Aveed, the expensive every 10 week injection that would have seemed to have an advantage that way, can cause anaphylaxis or what is referred to as a POM reaction pulmonary oil microembolism, which means that a V lasts a long time because it's packaged in a type of an oil, okay? In fact, all those steroid preparations are in an oil base, and that's how it slows down the absorption over time. That's part of the pharmaceutical preparation they've made. Well, this one, if you get any of that oil that comes with this one, it can get into the bloodstream and it can just travel all the way to lungs. And y'all had pulmonology, I know about pulmonary embolism and little bitty things that can go down to the small area and block, block off. So it can happen. So because of that, because this palm reaction, um, which is everything you think, chest pain, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, you have to be certified to prescribe it and you have to be certified to administer it. So you're not going to see a bead all over planet Earth because it requires a certain type of preparation. And you have to watch that person for 30 minutes after each injection. So you would not send somebody home with a bead to self-administer IM periodically because of the distance. They would have to come back and see you because it's a medical liability to give somebody something like that. Uh, that requires a certain expertise to administer. Okay, so that's that's that one. Okay. And a lot more people are doing self injections too. 
Um, and the big problem is, is that the doctor prescribes them, you know, like 1.5, and mm -hmm. they can't draw 1.5, no. or they shoot some of it out, and then they would come back, you know, because it's controlled, so you can only get it every 28 days. Yes. They come back, you know, on day 20, and they're like, well, I'm out. And you're like, well, you shouldn't be. And then they have like their testosterone rage going on. It's, it's, it's so you see, there's, there are issues in any time you involve the patient administration and management, you, you create some ad additional problems that go with it. Anybody else have any experience with it? I have a question, actually. Yeah. I understand that one of the disadvantages to using the intravascular formulation is that you have those peaks and troughs. Mm -hmm. Why don't they say half the dose and do it weekly so that it's less? You could do you could you could do that. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of doing the doses for high were usually the, for the first two products, and not this would be it's like hundred. It can be anywhere from 150 to 400 milligrams every two to three weeks. So you could go 50 every week instead of 150 Q for two to three weeks. But then you're shot, 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 and then it's painful. Um, so the the interval was kind of developed to respond to. Uh, pain of injection, so it's kind of a trade-off. There's, It's not wrong, it's not pharmaceutically wrong, it just creates an extra burden for somebody if they were coming, if they wouldn't do it at home, they have to drive them to see you. And, and that's a copay, and that's and a big deal. And that's, that's the other side, is every time you come in, you're paying people to do stuff. So it's just, it's just a matter of safety, convenience, acceptability, all of these things go into it. We'll see the patches. There's a good number of patch types available too. I'm just give, I'm gonna give you one, but these are usually applied daily, usually at night. Uh, the adverse effects are what you'd expect they would be for most patch medications. is skin issues, so you get skin irritations, contact dermatitis, and itching. I have seen people who have such a significant rash where you put a patch on, they can't use them. I mean, just terrible itchy rash that, that just goes on. So you see, you keep sticking it, you can get little itchy places all over. So sometimes people can't use it for that reason. Um, some people will get over that. Some people will not get over that. Um, so that's, that's your big issue. The, the advantage is once a day at night. The disadvantage is the skin irritation to get it. Implantable subcutaneous pellets, test to pell. Um, it may be implanted by physician into fat tissue of the buttocks. Uh, I'm not really going to give you the expectation of the handout, but they usually come in like 75 milligram little pellets that are then implanted, and there's a device to implant those. The advantage is compliance because you can leave those things in for months before you have to deal with them. But the problem is, if you have any complication whatsoever, you have to cut them out. They have to be surgically removed. I think I was in Good Shepherd and there was a patient who had like a depot provera or somebody who's had a pellet. Who was it I was with? And they, was it you? Maybe it was you. And the patient had those, had implanted things, and those are, those are used um, in the case just so that you have compliance and know that you have birth control for a long stretch of time. But if there's an issue, and this person was having a medical problem that could have been related to an adverse effect of the product, then you have to dig them out. That would be surgically removed. So it's nice because you don't have to come back all the time, but it can be bad if it work if, it, if you have an adverse effect because of what's implanted. Okay. So here's what the little device looks like. So it's a little little gun, and you see it's a fairly wide needle that you take down to the uh, subcutaneous fat level. Put them in. Yikes. How many do you put in? Does it depend? It depends. It depends on, on the level. So they're like 75 milligrams. They usually start out with like 75 to 150, maybe even more, depending on how low you are. And then you you watch it for a, about a two to four week period to see if you're doing okay. If not, then you plant again to so kind of figure out what your level is. So you titrate them like you titrate anything else. Would those dissolve, or would you, like, after a set period of time, you have to remove them anyway? They, what, what happens is at a set period of time, you have to come back and re-implant them. So oh. you, you implant them, and then they last for a long stretch. And it's months. It's like six months, six mm -hmm. to nine months. So you put them in, and then you just keep monitoring the levels. And then when your levels start to come back down, then you come back and you re-implant. So it's, okay. it's a repetitive re-implantation. So you would know you know you work will get an IM shot every two to three weeks, but you'll get implantation every six to nine months. 
and with the number of pellets that are needed. And it's like everything else. You might start out, you know, needing only one or two pellets, and as you get older, your level drops more for whatever reason is there. You might need to put in three pellets to do that. But yeah, it's a repetitive implant. I'm going to move this before I go down. That's all I need today <laughs> is an accident. Yeah. Yeah. I left my hand down on it. I did. Okay. There's also a gel uh, called Andro Gel is what I'm going to give you 1% testosterone. There's several different gel products. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice product. Uh, it just comes in a little foil pack that you take them off and you kind of rub it into a certain area. Um, and there's, I'm going to show you a picture in a second. The disadvantage of using these gels that kind of that go percutaneous absorption, that go through the skin into the bloodstream, is that they can virilize children or others secondarily if they are touched. So you really want children to avoid touching them, uh, so they need to be in areas that are kind of covered so that uh, children don't do it. And I know that sounds like a weird adverse effect of how in the world is that going to happen, but if you put that stuff on fresh and you have a two-year-old and that two-year-old is playing with you and they get her hand, it, it just goes in. It's not like you just wash it off and you put that stuff on and don't know about it. It starts to go into your body and you can virilize children. Females can be virilized too. So it, it has happened so it's a, enough of a caution that it's, it's not just safe. You know, once you rub it on, it's okay. Um, you don't want pregnant women doing stuff with that. I mean, it can mess up the fetus. So there's, there's issues with these, these things. Okay, here's some application areas. You see the upper shoulders, uh, abdominal area, uh, places where it can be applied. Okay, PDE5 inhibitors. They should be offered as first line. Okay, we kind of got out of the testosterone. That's the primary hypogonadal testosterone. That's a, a clean fix. Okay, okay, you don't have your testosterone levels are normal and you have ED. Now we're into what we look at for that. And the PD5 inhibitors are, are the first one that we would look at. Um, they're all considered equally effective. There's several different agents available right now. They're, one is not considered better than another. However, one might be better in one patient than another in, a, in another patient. So Viagra might work for Mr. A, but it doesn't work for Mr. B. Cialis works for Mr. B, but not for Mr. A. But if you look at 100 people on Cialis and 100 people on Viagra, it's about the same level of response. So you just have to work around with these agents in, in different uh, patients to see what will work. Uh, if, they don't try, if they don't work on one, you can try another one uh, before you go on further down that list of invasive therapies for ED. The available agents are these, uh, Sildenafil, Viagra, Vardenafil, Levitra, Tadalafil, Cialis, and Avanafil, Stendra. Uh, if I were to give you any names, I'll give you both generic and trade. I'm not going to make you remember both different directions, but if you watch ESPN, you get enough of Cialis. I mean, they, they are one of the biggest marketers ever. So, you know, you're sitting there with little children, what's that? What's that commercial? What's the score? <laughs> okay. The, the actions, they selectively inhibit PDE5. We've already kind of talked about it. And by doing that, they, uh, the enzyme, uh, that's the enzyme that, that gets rid of cyclic GMP. So when you inhibit it, you have higher levels of cyclic GMP. Keeps calcium out of the cell so that things stay dilated better. I'm just going to move on to have a couple of things. So what are the adverse effects? The adverse effects are usually mild to moderate uh, in intensity. They are limited. If you just leave it alone, it will usually go away. And they're more common with higher doses. All of it's kind of common sense. Higher dose things usually the same, the same side effect is more intense. Um, let's look at what some of them are. But uh, and there, there can be notable. Headache can absolutely happen. Anytime you have a vasodilating drug, you can, you can vasodilate, you can create a headache if it causes dilation of cerebral arteries. Y'all are, are just a day or so away from neurology and y'all go into all these types of vascular headaches, but dilators can do that. Flushing, again, if you're a vasodilating drug, you can have flushing, so you can see facial flushing get very red. Uh, dyspepsia, people just kind of feel queasy, a little bit um, uh, upset stomach. 
nasal stuffiness, also from basal dilation. Basal dilate the, the uh, arteries within the nasal passages. And then abnormal vision, blue vision can happen, and it's kind of transient, an odd effect, but, but real. Some of the bigger things to worry about, hypotension, it's a big warning, but it probably doesn't happen as often as you might think, but it can. So cardiovascular assessment should be done before therapy. And a lot of the patients, honestly, who get Viagra already have atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease anyway, and they're very often treated with other medications that cause vasodilation that can cause orthostatic hypotension. So you just have to know that's already in there. If I had a patient who complained about lightheadedness and dizziness when they got up out of a chair on whatever medicines they were on, they're probably higher risk for um, hypotensive responses when you put in an erectile dysfunction drug. Another uh, adverse effect is acute hearing loss, sometimes with uh, tinnitus and dizziness, but it's not that common. Okay, this is an important point. This is a, a big one that you have to know about because there's a medical liability with it if you don't know about it and don't respond to it, and that is cardiovascular uh, counseling. Um, all PD5 inhibitors are contraindicated in men who are taking long or short-acting nitrates because they can potentiate hypotensive effects and create quite a hypotensive response. In fact, they've even been reported to cause MIs in some people. If you are already kind of dilating, you dilate more and you divert blood flow to an ischemic area or one that's prone to ischemia, then you can actually provoke an MI. And that is an issue to look at. Okay, so the combination of a PDE5 inhibitor and a nitrate increases risk for hypotension and increases problems I talked about. All men who are prescribed that need to be informed about that interaction and the hypotensive potential. To give you a little more detail about it, the length of time that you actually have to not be using the drug. See, the, the drugs PDE5 inhibitors are not generally chronically dosed. They're used episodically. So if you think Saturday night's the night, then you take your medication at the right time, and then you get the benefits you want. Okay, so you have to be warned of the danger. Okay, with, with Viagra, 24 hours before or after taking a nitrate preparation, that creates a unique problem. What if you took Viagra and then 24 hours later, within the next 24 hours, you had chest pains from something, and then you were reaching for the nitrate? Then you can, you'd have to, you probably reach for it, but you might have a hypotensive response. So that's why they are generally contraindicated straight up in people who are using a nitrate, because you have to not only not use it for so many hours before you take the Viagra, but then you have this interval afterwards, and you really don't know what you're going to have to use then. So it has to be warned uh, and counseled for. The time interval is longer for Cialis. It's 48 hours because that drug lasts longer. And then uh, there, the intervals for uh, Levitra and Stendra are not reported, but they're probably 24 hours based on how long the drugs work. So it's something you have to think about, talk about, and counsel a patient about uh, if, this, if they're going to look at using it. And most people who have unstable cardiac disease with frequent use of nitrates would not be put on a PDE5 inhibitor unless they go black market and do it against advice. Okay? I've given you this in terms of dosing. I don't expect you to remember dosing about all these agents. I, I, I have an uh, outcome statement, and I want to see if you look at it specifically. <laughs> just checking it out. Checking. <laughs> you're getting me back. Oh, you just are getting me back? <laughs> oh, goodness. See you later. <laughs> the only agent that you have to do dosing for is Tadalville C. Alice. And uh, that, that is the out. You know how I work off my objectives for So you've got these learning objectives in print on the handout. But Cialis is the only one I, I need you to know about for testing purposes. Uh, but I'm going to give you, I just want to talk about how these things are dosed so you understand the principles behind it and then the principles are the same for whatever agents. 
Um, Viagra starting dose is 50, that's the, the traditional starting dose. It's taken one hour before planned sexual activity. And they all had their little intervals, either half hour, hour, or two. But you can take it anywhere from a half hour to four hours, and that will be acceptable. Uh, the maximum frequency of administration is once per day, so you don't just say, oh, if one Viagra was good, I'm going to do two this time. No, you don't do that. You have a raging headache, you could be flushing, I mean, it's not, it, some, I'm telling you, patients will come up with all kinds of things. Well, that was pretty good sex last time. If I do two, it's going to be out of sight. Well, maybe not. So they need to know one is what it is. Uh, the dose after, so one time per day, that's it. The dose can be increased to 100 or reduced to 25 depending on what happened. If the person did not have adequate sexual functioning, they can, you always dose them up. And if they had too many adverse effects like headache or flushing, but they had a good erection, then you try a lower dose. So you come out with a starting dose at some interval before intercourse is planned, and, and they evaluate, does that work for me or not? If it does not, if it's ineffective, then you can double the dose up to see if that works. Of course, you have to counsel for more potential for side effects. If they had, if it was effective and they had side effects, then you may cut the dose in half. So you have to look at if it's not effective, you can increase the dose. If you have side effects, you cut the dose down. But you have to hope and keep effectiveness. Okay, but that's how you work with those drugs. But the big thing is, has to be taken before planned sex at a certain time interval, and you can only dose at one time. You, if you're looking for a night time of passion, you cannot go reaching for that bottle five times. One, actually, one is going to work the way it's supposed to for an extended period of time anyway. That's another reason for the, the 24 hours. Okay. Now, duration of action, see four hours or more, okay? Uh, if you're older, in general, just another representative principle, if you have older patients, and I'm going to say older, what is older? You know, <laughs> physiologically old people at 60, you might start with lower end things. If they're already on hypotensive producing drugs, you might start lower. Uh, if they're 70 or 80, you might start lower. Uh, have to be careful. Then uh, what happens if they are on, there's one drug you have to be watching for all the time, and that's alpha blockers. Alpha blockers are a problem with uh, PDE5 inhibitors because together they can really produce a hypotensive response that is significant. And I've written in here, a patient should be stabilized on alpha blocker therapy before initiating treatment. What does stabilize mean? Give it a week. Okay, just, you don't want to start an alpha blocker and a PDE5 inhibitor at the same time. If they've been on it chronically for at least a week, that's stabilizing up and they're, they're not having hypotension, then, then you're okay. So that's what that means. Intraurethral alprostadil, okay, MUSE, synthetic form of prostaglandin E1, it induces the erection by dilation of arteries in the corporal cavernosa with resulting increased blood flow. So it's another one of those uh, vasodilating drugs. Effectiveness is increased by using it with Actus, which is an adjustable penile constriction device. C. Okay. If you use it alone, it may not, you, you may get increased blood flow, but you do better if you actually constrict around the base of the penis so that it lasts longer. So that's the, the big issue with it is, is that, so you use little bands. Isn't that something? <laughs> that's again one of those devices, that's why you have to have shared decision making. You may have a partner that doesn't want some ring around the base of the penis, but who knows, maybe that's their thing. That's their thing. Okay, enough. Starting <laughs> start the drift. I gotta come back. All right. Intra urethral You see the little deal here. There's a little injector device that comes with these, uh, put put into the uh, uh, urethra, and then it administers the little tablet. They, they're little pellets that then dissolve uh, within. Therapy has to be initiated in a physician's office because of potential complications. Could be bleeding. You don't give a device and say, here, go home and do this. You do it in the office. There could be bleeding. There could be a vasovagal reflex because you get this big vasodilation and, and a crash. 
hypotension, and priapism, which by definition is erection lasting greater than four hours, thus considered an adverse effect by some people and others not so. And so it just depends on, but it can be quite, uh, it can be quite a problem. I have seen patients at the Oklahoma City VA who have priapism and it's constant. And so when they're walking down the hallway, it's kind of hard to hide these things. I'm, I'm just, it sounds funny, and it is, but it's a problem, you know, for, for that particular patient. Okay, so this would be administered in office. They come in little bitty pellets, like, I think it's like 25 microgram increments, and you have to, you do dose adjustments. So they will administer these in the office to figure out what is required and what stabilizes, you know, what work, and then they go from there. So it's a, it's a fine tuning based on observation. The advantages is local application, so you have minimal systemic effects, very few drug interactions, but the adverse effects are penile pain, particularly urethral pain and burning. It's just that medication against the, the endothelium of the urethra. You would expect it would sting and it does. Okay, intracavernous injections. Now we're getting up to more invasion. We've gone from just administration to the urethra into administration into the corpora cavernosa. Yikes. Okay, alprostadil, caverject, and edix. And then uh, there's a combination of papaverin, a generic agent, phentolamine, colregitine, and alprostadil. That's, uh, we'll talk about it in a second, but uh, these are some of the agents that we have available. They are synthetic versions of prostaglandin E1, just like the MUSE thing that we just got through talking about. It's the only intracavernous drug approved by the FDA in the U.S. It's, uh, it works just like the MUSE does. It, uh, prostaglandin E1 located in the endothelium of arterial blood vessels in the corporate cavernosum, and it, it reduces intracellular calcium and causes vasodilation. Okay, we've already seen that. Administration, the initial dosing and self-injection instruction should take place in the physician's office. The dose is the lowest required to provide the patient with an erection that is satisfactory for intercourse but is maintained no longer than one hour. The site of injection is usually along the dorsal lateral aspect of the proximal third of the penis, so it's more near the body than, than further away. And you administer, you alternate administration sites from one corpus cavernosum to the other. So they go back and forth. You don't just keep sticking to the same area. Uh, doses should not be repeated any sooner than 24 hours. And uh, just like the other agents. So here's the sites of administration, okay? Proximal third, either one side or the other. Okay, and you're administering with a very fine needle directly into the corpus cavernosum. So that's what's happening. I, I see faces. It does not look, look painful. Jeez. Okay. Don't underestimate. Don't underestimate a male's desire to have erection and what what it will go and get that done. People have it done. They get very used to it. It's it's a very tiny, almost like a tuberculin syringe, very tiny, um, and very small amount injected. Okay. What are the adverse effects besides being stuck in the penis, which is enough? <laughs> you know, pain is kind of like a duh. Uh, hematoma, okay, hit a vessel down there because uh, the penis is a very vascular organ and you can have a big bruise. I mean, just big uh, uh, swelling of blood. Well, that would be What's that? Well, yeah, that would, yes, that would be the end of the evening. <laughs> Fibrosis. Um, you have to prevent that. If you've got patients who are anticoagulated, this is kind of a difficult thing to do for somebody who's anticoagulated because if you stick them and they bleed and they're on aspirin, which a lot of them are, or they're on Coumadin, for heaven's sakes, they may just really bleed a lot. So the recommendation is that if you're anticoagulated, that once you've injected, that you have to put pressure on the area for about five minutes. Okay, now that could be foreplay or whatever. Okay, but you have to, to keep it from, because if you don't, and you get this bleeding, you end up with fibrotic process inside the penis, and I think that would actually kind of mess things up over the long haul, too. Okay, and priapism is most common with intracavernous, which means you get a, a, an erection and it just remains four hours or longer, and that's priapism. Okay, 
The other little drugs I talked about that can be injected along with alprostil, papaverin is one. It's a nonspecific PDE inhibitor. See, Viagra is PDE5 inhibitor, very specific and unique, you know, in the, 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 uh, the penis. There, there's other uh, PDE5 in the body, so this is nonspecific. Uh, the major disadvantage is propism and corporal fibrosis. It can do that. Fentolamine is another one. Fentolamine is another injectable drug. It's a competitive alpha adrenergic receptor antagonist. You know, when you stimulate alpha receptors, what does it do to an arterial? Stimulate alpha receptor. It stimulate alpha receptor on arterial. It constricts. Alpha, alpha stimulation constricts, so if you're an alpha blocker, then you would, you would block that constriction and allow for relaxation. So it's, it's an a alpha adrenergic antagonist, so it, it, it blocks, so you don't get the constriction. Uh, it has to be used in combination with papaverin to achieve an effective erection. Okay. The common adverse effects for these mixed up drugs that you inject is hypotension, and if this hypotension is significant enough, you can get a reflex tachycardia. Tri-mix and bi-mix, I give you just so you've heard the terms, and Oklahoma tri-mix is around, bi-mix is too. Tri-mix is a combination of alprostadil, papaverin, and fentolamine, kind of like a little cocktail, mixed up, very effective, up to about 90% effective. So those three drugs are drawn up in a syringe and injected into the penis, and that's, that's how they do it. And then Vimix is alprostadil with papaverin or alprostadil with phentolamine. So if you have two agents, that's Vimix. If you have three, it's a trial. I have a question. Yeah? In the handout, it said that they were um, not um, yeah. FDA approved. So yeah. how, how are they mixing them and all that if they're not FDA approved? They, they are, it's, it's a good question. They're not FDA approved for this indication, but they are, have been used for this indication. You can use medications for things that are not FDA approved. It happens all the time. So you don't have to have FDA approval to do it. If you are going to compound, you have to compound sterile, and you have to be in a, a certified compounding pharmacy. But there's no rule against it, I mean, to actually put those together uh, as long as you meet all the requirements for a compounding pharmacy, which are much more owners now than they used to be. Okay. But no, it's, it's been done. It's been done for quite a long time. Yeah. Okay. But you'll get into the F FDA approval. Some things are FDA approved. Most, a lot of things are. But there are some things that are used pretty commonly that never achieve FDA approval because the cost to get the FDA's approval is beyond what's needed, and the evidence is so strong. Uh, some health facilities actually have policies about using drugs off label. Uh, just to, to protect themselves, uh, but uh, it's, they still do it. It's still done. Okay. Just kind of discuss it in the medical community. We, the, the practitioners agree how they want to use something. They look at the evidence. They make a decision. The system says we're going, and they'll do it. Okay. Other treatment options. Did y'all see these the other day? The vacuum, the vacuum constriction. Just photos. A vacuum is applied to the penis for a few minutes, causes tumescence and rigidity, and then you sustain it by using the ring again. Here comes the constricting ring, but it's negative pressure, so it creates negative pressure, and the penis just it inflates and it stays up, and they, they constrict it down. Isn't that something? Okay. Well, surgical treatments, uh, vascular surgery can be. Vascular surgeries can be curative, uh, particularly in young patients. You're not going to see many vascular surgeries in older people because it's usually generalized, generalized atherosclerotic disease. What are you going to do? You can't replace the whole arterial line if it's clogged off. But if you have congenital or traumatic erectile dysfunction, you can, and erectile dysfunction can happen for a lot of reasons. You can have a car wreck and get hit in the penis and end up with a blockage in a certain part of the vasculature. Uh, but if there's a focal occlusion and there's not generalized vascular disease, then surgeries can be done, and that corrects the problem entirely. Now here's other surgical treatment, implantation of semi-rigid or inflatable prostheses. Uh, they do produce unnatural uh, erections, but they are, they are devices that are put in. You pump it up. You see all this little thing in here? Put in the inflatable cylinder. Here's the pump. 
uh, release valve. When they did these things several years ago, there was just so much greater risk of infection, which you would imagine. Um, and it's just kind of bulky and unwieldy, but there are people who do this. That, that can't take a medication, have problems with them, so they need another way, so this is available. Okay, I'm stopping. Any questions on that? Maybe wants to know if you can overpump it. <laughs> I would suspect you probably could. You know, the air sliders have a certain limit to it, so you're just moving down into the cutter, girl. <laughs> Uh, you know, honestly, honestly, they're going to have the air bladder is going to go to a certain size, then they're going to have a limit on how far it can go up, and then you have to take the air out. Yeah. Is there any fix for a part that's needed, or is everything still functioning? Oh gosh, in a quadriplegic, you have you're going to have no nerve supply, so you would you would not be able to probably. You could use Viagra, possibly, you know, and, and see if that would work. You can also try implantable devices. You can do that. Um, uh, and it, you know, it, it will depend on the age of the person, you know, the functionality of the vasculature, but the nerve supply is out. Mm -hmm. And you know, normally, erasure starts in that, uh, uh, there's a reflex arc in the spine, you know, and, and that's, it, it's set off by sensation and imagery, mental imagery, imagination, and then that's what leads to stimulation. So that reflex arc is going to be broken. Uh, so physical things, there are things you could do. It's a good question, but I think it will depend on how old the person is. And you might have effect and she might not. Okay. Any other questions about ED? That's all you ever want to know. <laughs> it's like, more, than you, more than you want to know. Okay. Okay, that's a complete presentation. All right. Therapy of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Y'all seen this, you know where the prostate is. What is the prostate good for? What did they tell you? What is it good for? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, okay, what is it good for causing a problem? No, what it actually, what does the prostate actually do? It secretes something. Give your bones, like, yeah, you like into the, like, the sperm and the semen. It's yes, and what is, tell me more. That's all I got. Okay, well, that's, that's good. Okay, so what, yeah. there's, yeah. It does contribute to semen. What does it contribute? I think it like cleans out the urethra to make sure it's not too acidic or something. So that's, when the semen comes through, it doesn't die. You win. It's it is it is that it is either a, the. Uh, it's either an out the prostate gives either an alkali or yeah, very right. very weakly acidic um, nature to the to the ejaculate. And what and why is that important? What are vaginal secretions like? Acidic. They're acidic. What's wrong with an acidic environment for sperm? It shuts down their motility. They may not work as well. So there's actually the benefit might actually be in reducing the acidity of the vaginal secretion so that the sperm is more viable and can get to the egg. And the other thing it might do is it might actually be nutritious. It might provide a nutrition or an energy source for the sperm that are secreted. And otherwise, from that, it may be unknown. And they're really not quite sure all what it's doing. Okay? Just, I'm just asking because everybody wants to know what's good of a prostate. You know, maybe it'll have something to do with your uh, fertility if you're a male. Okay, depending on how, how that is working. Okay. Uh, diagnosis, y'all been through all of this. Y'all have done the maneuvers in lab, correct? Don't need to worry about digital rectal exam. Prostate specific antigen blood test, have y'all talked about that? Yes. Okay. Do they recommend that it be done every year in men? No. That's, it's changed because it used to be at what age when you got to 50 that you checked it, checked it repetitively and now they don't necessarily do that unless they find something on examination or you're a person who has a family history or you have a certain risk. Okay, just throw it out there because it's kind of cycling around. Urine flow studies uh, can be suggested for BPH. IV polygrams can let you know if there's blockages up higher so you can, you can look at that as well. Cystoscopy is very commonly used now because you, anymore now if you can see things directly you want to do that so that can be helpful and then urinalysis lets you know if you've got urinary tract infections because if you have an infected prostate that can lead to uh, swelling, tissue uh, enlargement and it can create obstructions too. Stones can cause problems. Okay, 
I gave you the links for the American Urologist Association scoring system uh, for the ass assessing severity of BPH symptoms. Uh, I don't expect you to know the question. I'll just put them in the hand I'll say good look. And it has to do with how many times you have to get up and not to go to the bathroom. How often do you have urgency? There's a scale. Then you assign points and then you add up the score. And if the score is low, then it's mild disease. And if the score, you know, the score zero, it's no disease. If it's a low number, it's mild, moderate, and severe. So the scale is important to classify a person's level of disease based on symptoms and presentation. And you need to figure out mild, moderate, and severe because that dictates treatment selections. I am not going to ask you to memorize the scale or even the numbers. If I, if I give you anything about prostate, it will be the person has mild disease, the person has moderate disease. I might put the score out there just for fun, but I, I'm not going to, you don't have to know the numbers. And honest to goodness, there's so many things like this, you're going to have to look them up again. Your brains only have so much limit. It, to me, it's ridiculous. You're going to forget it next week anyway. What's the point? But I do need you to remember in your little brain, mild, moderate, and severe. That's important, okay? Can y'all do that for me? Yes. In, your, in your little brain, tax this it is almost dead. <laughs> oh gosh, I, didn't have a, I have heart for you, but it's, it's your life. <laughs> I'm not against you. We gotta have fun. It's Friday. Look, we gotta come like a little bit. <laughs> okay, so there's your scoring system. The scoring system is used to initially assess the patient so that you have a baseline. It's used to determine do they respond to treatment, and it's also used to help determine progression. The one thing you can know about prostate disease is progressive. It's not going to just show up and there, there it is. It shows up and there it is, and then it goes. It keeps growing yeah, unless you do something definitive. Okay. The treatment options are several. The first one is watchful waiting. Okay. Another word for don't do anything. Uh, it's, you monitor, but you don't do treatment. It's usually used for people with mild to moderate disease. If somebody doesn't care about getting up twice at night, and, they're, and they don't have a problem getting to a restroom, even though they know they're going to the bathroom more often, or they have urgency more often, but it's not bothering their lifestyle per se, you just watch them. At the point that it is bothersome, you're getting up five times at night, you go to the bathroom, no urine starts, then that begins to be a problem. So watchful waiting is from mild to moderate. You would not be watchful waiting in severe if the patient wouldn't let you because they're going to say fix something. Okay, alpha blocker drug therapy, big group that can be used. These agents inhibit the contraction of the prostate smooth muscles. You know, y'all know at the where the bladder goes into the urethra, there's a muscular ring around that urethra, and it's the alpha stimulation tightens that thing up. If you've already got tightening from prostate tissue kind of impinging on it, then what you need to do is relax the muscles as much as you can to get better flow. So alpha blockers actually block that area so that you have as much muscular relaxation of that ring as possible so that you can have urine flow. Now it may not make things perfect, but it can make it better. Okay? Um, it's useful for people with mild to for, with people from moderate to severe symptoms. So it's a moderate to severe symptom treatment. Another agent, just for fun, you know, Tadalafil, Cialis, PDE5 inhibitor may be considered as additional therapy to an alpha blocker if the patient also has ED. It's the only one of those PDE1 um, inhibitors that has an indication for prostate treatment. So if you have prostate problems. Uh, moderate prostate with e erectile dysfunction, then you could be treating two things at once. Um, it's the only one. The other ones probably also work the same way. They just don't have the FDA indication, but this one, this one does. Okay. There's another group of drugs called 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and we talked about that earlier. That's the one that converts testosterone to uh, uh, dihydrotestosterone inside the cell. Um, if what's good is that it can reduce prostatic androgen levels, the androgens inside the cells of the prostate, and result in a decrease in size as well as minimize the need for surgery. Those drugs actually cause tissue to shrink. Okay, they are they're tissue shrinkers without actually having to cut tissue out. 
So that's why they're helpful. And they're useful for people with moderate to severe symptoms with demonstrable prostate enlargement or if the prostate bleeding is present because of the enlargement. So you got moderate to severe disease, you can feel a huge prostate in there, uh, and you know you have to do some tissue reduction of some sort. That's that way to do it without actually going there and cutting and removing. Combination therapy of alpha blocker and 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. This is an important concept to get, and, I, and I'm going to be sure that y'all actually get this. Um, and it, it will come up again a little bit later. I'm, I'll say it again. But, but alpha blockers work, usually start working in two to six weeks, but 5 alpha reductase inhibitors don't start working until about six months. So if you've got a big prostate, and you're going to give them a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, they're still they're not going to be getting anywhere early on. So they're going to complain, I'm paying a big chunk of money, but I'm still having to get up and pee all night. So what usually happens is you give them an alpha blocker at the same time you give them a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor, and so they get more immediate symptom relief in the first couple of weeks that then improves while the tissue begins to shrink. So the combo is probably the most definitive thing you can do because you get early symptom relief and then you get definitive symptom relief when that drug reaches full expression and shrunk tissue. So that's a good way to go. If you have a patient who's got symptoms and a humongous prostate, put them on an alpha blocker and get immediate, some immediate relief while you let the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor eventually get rid of the tissue. Okay? So that's how they look at those. Okay, it may be best for people at great risk for progression, such as being over 50 with low urine flow, high PSA levels, or large prostate glands, but it doesn't have to be limited to that group. Um, so, I've already told you those things. Okay, that's enough for what I want you to know. Balloon dilation is another um, option. It's a catheter with a balloon at the tip. They used to use the VA all the time. You put in the catheter and then you insert the balloon and then you uh, stretch out the urethra where it's narrowed by the prostate gland. So it basically just is physical opening and pushing back the tissue. You kind of pull, pull it up and back, blow it up and just kind of open up a hole uh, between the bladder and the urethra. Usually used for severe symptoms. Surgery, there's a ton of surgeries that can be done. Usually for people with severe symptoms that have been unresponsive to everything else, a couple of them are, just, just so you know, have heard the words of tuna, T-U-N-A, transurethral needle ablation, cystoscope go in there, you know, ablate tissue just directly. Another is transurethral microwave thermography. It is what it says it is. You actually are obliterating with microwave, you know, and, and heat. Okay, that's something. Uh, other invasive procedures are open prostatectomy. That's, that's put them out with anesthesia and just go in there and actually cut it out. Uh, and then transurethral resection of the prostate, another, another procedure. So you can actually get to surgery if needed. Complementary alternative medicines are also out there. If you go into a, these nature stores and whole food sort of stuff you look at, there's things out there just blanket statement. There is nothing out there that actually really does any good. People swear about things, but again, it's the placebo uh, effect. Uh, Saul Palmetto it was one of the agents that used to really, for a while, the urologist actually thought it actually had some benefits, so it kind of had some, it was touted a little bit, but now it's not touted. It's kind of gone the other direction. So if you go in and just kind of roam around the stores and look, you can see a bunch of things. Black drought is another one that you get out in the, the local culture and, and whatever uh, available. But those, they don't have anything available. Um, so no proven benefit from over-the-counter things. It's prescription or surgery. Yes? For the combo therapy, yeah. once, like, at six months, like, could you ever get them off the alpha blocker? Or would you want to, or you just always do No, you could. You can, something? once you get six months out, if the person's doing really a whole lot better, then what you can do is reduce dose. You can do a trial off to see if, if you're still doing just well, and if you can get rid of it. Okay. So, yes, it, it's a way to get you in and to get symptom relief, and then once you've got it, if it works well, then you can try to pull it off. It's like all medicines. Some things can be pulled back mm -hmm. or back titrated. Okay. 
Okay, let's look at the drugs just a little bit in detail. There are a bunch of these agents approved by the FDA, terazosin, doxazosin, then tamsulosin, alphazosin, and solidosin, known by the names probably hydrin and cardura more often, Flomax, uroxetral, and rapaflov the ones that you see. Flomax probably more than the other ones. I've already told you how they work, but I have to make one distinction in these drugs. You know they're alpha blockers, you understand where they are working, but there are two different types. There are non-selective, they just block alpha receptors all over the body where alpha receptors are, which means they can have water side effect profile, or the ones that are alpha 1A specific, and that is the receptor that's more unique to the bladder neck and that muscle ring. And those are tamsulosin, alphazosin, and solidosin. Those are preferentially binding to those receptors. So when you look at the alpha blockers, they're all the same. The nonspecific are more diverse in potential for side effects, and the more narrowly focused ones may be less likely to produce side effects. I mean, they all produce them, but maybe less likely. Okay, we've, uh, this is just a picture, just kind of showing you what it looks like when they're treated. Okay, uh, what's, is there any difference in alpha blockers? No, not really. You block an alpha receptor, what you're doing, a lot of things can do it. Um, so they're equally effective. They have a defined starting and maximum dose. So there's a lot of dose titration involved. I'm not going to ask you to remember all these doses on these things, except for two agents, and I think I told you in the handout, I think doxasis is in there, and then there's like Flomax, Tamsulosin. Those are the two that I want you to know. They have a starting dose, and they have an ending dose. And you generally start with the lowest dose possible, see how that works, and titrate up. Okay? That's, and that's how they're usually done. It takes two to six weeks before you see the benefit, like we had talked about. The major side effects, orthostatic hypotension and dizziness, we've heard these before, the same drug category, it's very common. Uh, it's called first dose effect. I think I told y'all this when I told y'all hypertension, that first dose effect is real. Um, they usually tell people to take them at night, but I told y'all about that because I told you about the man that was told to take the alpha blocker at night, and he got up out of bed and fell over because he was orthostatic and he hit his head, could have killed him. So now I think twice about it. I usually tell people to take their first dose when they're awake um, and be aware when you take that first dose, you gotta be careful about getting up and moving around. Just be very careful to see how it affects you then, then you'll get more adjusted to it as time goes by. I kinda need them in the ball game. So I, I don't want them to be doing nighttime stuff. Um, the first dose effect is more likely with those non-selectives that terasis and doxazosin, and then those the specific ones, it's less likely, maybe less likely. Okay, always lower doses, you start and you creep up to prevent the side effect of hypotension and dizziness. And we've already talked about alpha blockers and PDE5 inhibitors when we talked about Viagra, et cetera. You have to be sure that, that, that when those two are together that you're doubly cautious about blood pressure changes you want the alpha blocker stabilized before they get a PDE5 inhibitor. And what does stabilize mean? They've been on it for what duration of time will you say? About a week. Just ball game figure. They've been on it for a week and they're kind of adjusted. They're, they're going to be adjusted by then. Okay. Another adverse effect of these uh, alpha blockers can be lower volume of ejaculate. More common with the selective. Okay, so you won't get dizzy, but you'll have less ejaculate. You choose. Okay. <laughs> okay, here's another adverse effect. Planned cataract surgery. This is an unusual adverse reaction, but it is notable, and the urologist will get all over you if you don't think about this. You have to avoid alpha blockers until surgery is completed. Particularly, people on Tamsulosin at Flomax and other alpha blockers may develop intraoperative floppy iris syndrome which can cause retinal detachment, lens problems, or an endophthalmitis inflammation inside the eyeball. So you have to be careful, and it's more likely when you're using an alpha blocker. So if you've got surgery planned, you pull them off of that agent, you know, for several days before the surgery, then you have the surgery, then you let that heal up a little bit, and then you come back. But it will be noted. The people who do those eye surgeries are going to ask specifically about alpha blockers, so 
even if you forget to say they're going to check it out okay, for you. The five alpha reductase inhibitors, there's two, finasteride and butasteride. I'm not asking you to know, remember doses on these and just give them to you, but they're pretty much easy to remember. It's a single dose a day, one's five and one's point five. Uh, Proscar and Avidart. The mechanism of action is what I said, it just blocks the conversion of testosterone to the principal intracellular androgen, as we've already said. Um, the enzyme is located in cells of the prostate, um, also in cells of testes and hair follicles, um, to facilitate increased levels of DHT. What's interesting about these agents is because they also are in hair follicles, they're also used as treatments for male pattern baldness and hair thinning. Um, so they, they have been used for that. And they can cause hair growth if you already if you can grow hair because you know what they do. Okay. Or uh, I'm sorry, they they block it, okay? They block it so that you can have effects in other parts of the body other than just the prostate. Uh, dosing. The doses are fixed, but it takes six to 12 months. So that the earliest will be half a year, the most will be a year. The biggest issue with these agents in prostate treatment really is patient compliance for long enough to see the benefit because these are not cheap. They're actually fairly expensive drugs. And that's why if you just give that and you don't give some way to get symptom relief, somebody's not likely to unload the amount of money times 12 to get towards benefit, they will quit it way before they get somewhere. So they really have to understand what's happening and how long it will take. Adverse effects from 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, erectile dysfunction, decreased vitamin ejaculate, decreased libido in 2 to 3 percent, and gynecomastia. They use most of the adverse effects for sexual in nature, resolved with the continued use. So people have to be aware when they go into it that that might happen so that they are uh, mentally prepared for it and then they will give, they'll have some patience with you. If you don't predict adverse effects, it can be really troublesome and then it happens, you look like you don't know what you're doing and they don't want to listen to you more. So to me, I would rather predict adverse effects even if they're, if they're significant. I will assure them it's, it's a low likelihood, but it could happen so I need you to talk to me and help me if we see that. That way, when it comes up, they're, they're less likely to be upset with you. You've already said it could happen, but it's not likely, but anyway, call me. Then you can deal with it. If you just say nothing, and they go out there and happen, they go, well, shoot, I did this and I got that. I don't know if I'm going to do the next thing you say. It, it more has to do with confidence in your competence with how you do it. It's the way you present it. Um, these agents should not be handled by pregnant women because of potential adverse effects on male fetuses. In pharmacies, it's pretty well noted if you're a woman, you don't handle finasteride. If you're pregnant, um, if you're doing anything, you're wearing gloves and you stay away from it. It's just dust. In pill bottles, when you shake out pills, there's just dust that just gets up into the air anyway. So be careful. Okay, the PDE5 here, I told you, Tadalafil can be used, um, can be helpful on BPH symptoms, but it's not great. It wouldn't be a first line anything, but if you had ED and, and moderate BPH, it could, you could think about it. Okay. The three alternative agents, I told you salt palmetto was one. The other things are beta, cetosterol, and pigeum. Lack of published data. I just wanted you to see the names of what they were. So if somebody came at you, salt palmetto is the big one that people deal with mostly. The other two are out there, but just kind of nothing's nothing's for our purpose that's Schultz uh, yeah and then oh this is a real uh, oh my gosh I was, I was in there eating crap I did a selfie I was laying here he just came in there and laid down like oh how sweet don't let him don't let him I'm going to catch him he's having a hard time being in the location is he? he doesn't like it? no he likes it out there but it's still just kind of getting used to everything is when he's outside, he is sniffing everything. I mean, the whole yard, like, just checking everything out. And when you're sitting outside, he just goes around the house, and he's patrolling. He, just, he, he doesn't go away, he just goes around. So you'll see him go around, and he always goes counterclockwise. They figure that out. <laughs>